Hello, my name is Kevin Starr. I work for ABB in the Process Automation Division. Over my career, I've had a chance to work on a lot of data analysis and tuning. And one of the areas that I find the most interesting for me is frequency analysis or 4A analysis. And this is actually going to be part two of our discussion when we get into data and data variations and different ways to look at it. In part one, we looked at statistical analysis where we pulled in all these this data related to average, max, min, mean, autocorrelation, histograms. And if you didn't get a chance to see part one, down in the link below, you can go and watch that video. We call it descriptive statistics. In this video, we're going to get into the frequency side. If it's oscillating, that's what we're interested in. We're going to be looking at defining what a cycle is, go through a period and an amplitude, what's the Nyquist and fundamental frequencies, what's the 4A series, amplitude and power spectrums, accumulated power, and then spectral overlay. We're going to mix and discuss those in this particular discussion. This should take around 45 minutes, um, so sit back and relax, and you may want to watch this a few times. Um, once we get done with part two, we'll, we'll, if, down the road we'll do a part three where we get into identification um, process modeling, which is really closely related to tuning. Now, what we're interested in here is a process. You know, we've been talking about a step change. Now we're interested in cycles. Cycles can come from a wide range of, of rotating devices, control loops, batch processes, tanks that are oscillating, but they come in different frequencies. So our ability to identify a cycle is important if we couple that with our knowledge of tuning. So that's the question, is if I have these oscillations coming in, how well is my control system going to deal with it? Now, in this particular discussion, we're going to deal with steps and cycles. A step is where I make a set point change or I have a load change, and we want to see how it responds. But we also have cycles that we have to deal with. And we're going to get into Parsifal's theorem and 4A's transform and start trying to figure out how this, um, these frequency transforms work. But in, in the case of a step change, what you can see, I'm just showing an example of a disturbance coming in. If I have a step change, my control will regulate to that. But if I have a disturbance change, and I'm showing a step disturbance right here, my control will bring it back. And that kind of makes sense. If we use direct synthesis tuning and we used our... Um, tau ratio on our clue, we can calculate how long it'll recover from a step change. But what happens when we hit it with a cycle? Now that's what we're going to be talking about is the cycle and the cyclic nature of our control and how do we use the tools that we have at our disposal for determining the frequency content of what our control system is being hit with. In order to first understand that, let's go through a sine wave. You know, we have a sine wave here, you know, 0, 90, 180, 270, 360 degrees. We have an amplitude, which is really the average to the peak. Sometimes they call that peak-to-peak -peak amplitude. And then you have your period. So you'll see periods and frequencies. Um, and I just wanted to kind of throw that up there. And we're going to discuss that here in just a little bit. But when we look at a sine wave with an amplitude and it goes into a process, it comes out attenuated. Well, we hope so. Um, in tuning, we could actually make it come out worse. So what we're going to do in this first part of the video is talk about what in, in the technical term is a Bode plot. But we're going to refer to an amplitude ratio. And in this case, we have a system where the amplitude comes in with, a, let's say, A. And it comes out, it's going to be phase shifted and with an amplitude B. The ratio of the amplitudes on the input and the output of our process is what we refer to as the amplitude ratio. So if we know a little bit about tuning and, and control tuning, where we identify the frequency capabilities of our control, and then we couple that with ability to identify the cyclic content of our noise structure, we can tell exactly how our control system is going to work. And that's very important when you go to do troubleshooting. You just can't always make the loop faster and faster. Sometimes you have to go and find that disturbance and track it down. And that's what we're going to get into. Now, this example here is showing a, uh, a, uh, where we've got a tank and we have it well agitated. And so we have a constant inlet and outlet. And what we're doing is we're changing the concentration or the consistency of the inlet. So the consistency is what we're adjusting. And we're going to let that get you know, to equilibrium. And then we'll measure it on the output. So what we're seeing here is there should be a lag. And the lag is associated with the tank level. 
This is what we talked about in our level tuning, that if the tank's oscillating, this time constant is going back and forth, which is changing the frequency content that is passing through this very mixing vessel that we say should calm everything down. So here we show an example where I adjust the consistency or the concentration, and you can see it comes in here, and this thing agitates it, and eventually when it finally gets all the way to the same, uh, you know, distribution, we get the same consistency out. So that kind of makes sense is there's a mass, I've got a low tank level, and it takes a while for that to come up. Now what I did is I said, what if we just don't do a step change? What if we do a, um, a square wave? So on this top one, you can see I changed the frequency of the square wave such that the uh, process reached equilibrium before it changed directions. So you can see here that the ratio of the process to the input is one when the frequency is low enough. But then as I increase the frequency, you can see what happens where I'm moving my concentration up and down and it just doesn't attenuate, or it attenuates all of it. So what we end up having here is this frequency component. And what's interesting about this example, um, a controller where we're changing the set point works exactly the same way. So I'm just trying to help you understand or see the nature of cyclic signals and how they pass through a process. To further exemplify this example is if you have a high tank level. So now we have a lot of mass, a lot of mixing, a lot of energy. So when I change that consistency, it's going to take longer because that whole mass has to hit equilibrium before our process reaches the input. Okay, so it's taking a lot longer. This would be equivalent to uh, tuning a loop very, very slow. So when I talk about closed loop time constants and mass, you know, this is what goes on in my little head is I'm thinking of a tank and its volume. So here what you can see is when I change the uh, concentration, here I've just barely got the frequency aligned with how long it takes. So here I'm just right at a t an amplitude ratio of one, then I go a little faster, faster, and faster. You can see what happens is because of the mass, the frequencies are being absorbed much, much faster than if it was just like the tank with, with, or the pipe with no tank. You know, they just pass through. So this is what we're getting into is Bode plots and the frequency content of our process. And when you put it all together, you kind of see this. This actually is the same picture for a control loop. If you change the set point, depending upon how you tune it, your tuning and the mass of that tank are extremely similar. That's what I think is fascinating about control tuning is you get to define how fast it responds. But keep in mind, when you're doing that, you're adjusting the frequency content or its ability to attenuate different frequencies. This is important, especially when you get into cascade control loops where your outer loop's changing the set point of the inner loop. It, there is a point where you can drive your inner loop too fast and it just sits there and then everything goes out of whack. Um, I had an example of that where they were doing a three level cascade loop and they hadn't separated the loops by uh, enough time and, and the outer loop would oscillate, then the inner loop, and, and they just couldn't fix it. And it had to do with this. We were driving the inner loops faster than they could physically keep up. Now. In the world of process control, you typically aren't dealing with a frequency, you're dealing with a range of frequencies. So in this example, I'm showing you here, this might be what the process looks like off control. Now in your head, try to de de um, break that down into two different um, subsets. So this is frequency decomposition, but if we take this, I can see that if I take the noise structure out, Here's noise, here's the low frequency content. If I take those two signals and add them together, I have the original data set. So what we've done is we're, we're getting ready to get into the 4A transform. But in your mind, that's one of the things I like about a power spectrum or a frequency spectrum is it helps tune your eyes to what's actually going on in the process. Once you know that, then you can align it with your knowledge of control tuning and tell, can I fix this with control or do I need to go chase this thing down with um, you know, some sort of a other disturbance rejection. Now, if I've tuned the loop fast, as compared to the low frequency disturbance, I'm able to redirect that energy into the actuation device. That's so important when you're tracing down cyclic energy and disturbances. A disturbance never really goes away. It just shows up someplace else. So the disturbance will either show up in the process or show up in the actuation device. If you don't want it to show up in either place, you need to track down the source and remove it at the source. 
So whenever you can fix a disturbance by finding its root cause, it can have a huge impact through a cascading effect all the way through your process. But here, keep that in mind, it either shows up in the process or the actuation device. Here, if I've tuned my loop fast, I'm able to redirect that energy of the lower frequencies into my valve or my final control element. Here, if I've tuned it slow, the energy just passes right through. So again, remember our example of the tank, the low level and the high level? It's exactly the same kind of thinking. Does that energy pass through or does it get absorbed in the process? Those are things that you start to understand and play with. Now, very rarely do you have different tuning. You usually have a tuning with different frequencies. And this is where we're starting to get into frequency decomposition or spectral overlay and all that kind of neat stuff. So here I have a single control tuning or like a tank with a constant level. I have a low frequency drift and I have a high frequency drift. As that frequency drift changes, your ability to attenuate that frequency drops off. And that's where this amplitude ratio comes in. So if I had, for example, my off control process had an oscillation with an amplitude of 10, and then I turn the control on, I would expect, and, and let's say I had a afterwards amplitude ratio of five, I could say I had an amplitude ratio of 0.5. And then depending upon the phase shift, you could actually calculate you know, what the attenuation characteristics of that control loop actually is, which is an interesting theory, but it looks a little bit like this. So here, notice the picture I showed you before, it was a mirror image. So as we change the set point slow, my control can keep up with it, but as I change faster and faster, my control says, forget it. It's exactly the opposite when you look at disturbances. If my disturbance on this side is very, very slow as compared to how it's tuned, I can redirect that energy into my actuation device, and my process looks fine. Now, that's where you have to make some decisions, is how much of that energy do I want to go into my actuation device? How much do I want to go into the process? As your actuation device absorbs more and more, it's like a shock absorber on a car. If it's wiggling all the time, eventually it's going to wear out. So then you get into maintenance. So those are all kinds of neat things that you'll have to evaluate when you come up with how you want to tune this. But the idea is, is as you have slower frequencies, you can attenuate those until the frequencies get fast enough and then they pass right through your process. And these are some equations that we talked about with cutoff period and closed loop time constant and trying to identify those issues. Now, the summary here, and this is just a real quick overview of the cutoff is a function of the closed loop time constant. The closed loop time constant is a function of the open loop dynamics. So you start with the process, like the tank level. How much volume do I have? Then you look at the controllable energy. Where is this controller designed to operate in? That's a function of your control tuning. Then your ability to attenuate is dramatically improved or affected by how you tune that. So the attenuation tends to improve by a factor of 10 as you move a decade away. So these are kind of the rules of thumb. And again, if you want more information, we have a whole video series that you can see in the link below that will go into this. Now that was just a quick summary on why we're interested in frequency content is because our control is designed for a frequency band. And if you know how you tuned your loop, since you tuned it, you can know the in you know how it's going to reply or respond but the question is is how do i know what frequencies are coming into my process and that's what we're looking at here